Hello and welcome to Advanced Retro Adaptics. I'm Tyler Disney. Today I'm joined by my friend Cody Markels, who many of you listening will know from the ERE forum as Mountain Frugal. He's here at Fort Dirtbag with me for a few days on his way back from a road trip. I wanted to set some of the background for people who might not be familiar with your journal. So I'm just going to rip through some stuff quickly here. So you've worked a ton of different jobs from an early age, ranging from telemarketer, to curb painter, concrete buster, and that's like naming just a couple. You hold a PhD in plant biology? That's correct, yeah. And uh, you're considering going the, ac the full academia route, but you opted instead to co-found a startup where you spent five years. Then you took a mini sabbatical of six months in 2020 uh, to do a, a test run of being early retired. Um, then you went from that to a full-time gig as a data science researcher, and at the moment you're in a year-long stint uh, as a science communications illustrator, um, which combines your, your, your science background with art and drawing and stuff. You live in the mountains, you're an avid outdoorsman, you trail run, you mountain bike, you ski, you do a bunch of other stuff. So it seems to me that you fill your life with a high volume of really cool stuff and not a lot of stuff that you don't want to do. <laughs> and I feel like my job for this conversation is to figure out how you do that, <laughs> how you pull that off. <laughs> okay. Um, asking for a friend. What does a typical day look like for you? I mean, the day sort of starts the day before because I always try to get a good night's sleep. We go to bed at 10, wake up at 5.30 or 6, usually with an alarm, but sometimes not. And then we immediately, my partner and I, we both do creative things in the morning. I draw for a few hours. Uh, she writes for a few hours and we just enjoy coffee and enjoy a quiet time in the morning. And then uh, we transition over um, into work mode a little bit, uh, work for a little while, uh, exercise, have lunch, and then do calls or meetings or whatever in the afternoon and then um, make dinner in the evening go exploring if we want to go go fly fishing go fly fish the um the evening hatch uh if it's if it's in season usually that happens in in the spring and the summer um sometimes in the fall as well and then yeah make a fire if it's cold out uh, our houses we have electric uh, baseboard heaters but we never use them we only use wood heat um so we start a fire around 5 p.m um and then that goes until 10 and when we put on the last log and then do it all over again. We've, we've known like of each other through the forum for about two years, uh, when you came onto it, but only recently have we m met in real life and actually on your way, uh, down on the start of your road trip, about 10 days ago, you stopped by here and we had a night and you asked me an interesting question, which was you, you asked how you seem different to me in real life than uh, th then I, th then I thought you were like from the forum, just from your online persona. And I didn't really have a question at the time, but I thought about it. And the, my answer is I thought y you are way calmer. You are a way calmer person <laughs> than I assumed you were like from reading your updates, you know, your journal and just being blown away by like the sheer volume of cool stuff you did I had this assumption that you were like a coked out squirrel on trucker speed, <laughs> to be honest. And like, I figured you just bounce off the walls all day long, but you don't present that way at all. Like you're one of the calmest, chillest, like most present dudes I've met. And I, I think that actually like threw me off when I first met you. I was kind of like, oh, I, I didn't have to expect <laughs> to like have to hold fine. up my, my part of the conversation. Cause I figured you'd just be like hyper but you're not that's on the theme that like you don't do anything you don't want to do um and you're very organized and like i really want to dig into that in this conversation so i guess the first question is you present as very calm do you do you feel calm yeah i i mean i i generally feel very calm but that's the iceberg effect i would say because i've done meditation like fairly regularly since i was a little kid oh. or you know starting with like pitching and baseball mm. uh you really have to like calm your nerves and uh calm your emotions to be able to pitch well and to pitch consistently um and so i i was a pitcher for like 15 years in in baseball oh. then that transitioned into me reading like broader philosophy books and um finding like buddhism and buddhist meditation 
and I was, so I started doing like Zen, um, breath work, insight meditation, that sort of stuff, just from reading books. And I was like, oh, this sensation is very similar to just calming your mind before you're pitching. Mm. Um, and so, you know, while I wasn't formally training in meditation when I was doing baseball, I feel like I was kind of like indirectly training and now like reading more about it, reading more about sports psychology, those types of things. Um, there's a lot of, uh, meditation work that, that people do to calm their minds, to, to be able to focus, to get into the, to the flow of whatever it is they're doing. And, um, especially if you have to do something repetitive where you can mess up. Um, and so that's kind of the, the attitude that I bring towards most things that I, that I approach. Um, and I'm also just not afraid of, at all to fail. So, <laughs> uh, is, uh, has that been consistent or like, like, uh, did you used to be afraid to fail or have you just always kind of, kind of had a nonchalant attitude toward, towards it? Um, well, I think that it developed over time from like playing baseball, um, and then running cross country and playing tennis mm -hmm. in high school. Um, yeah, you just kind of learn that if you try your best and if that's not good enough or whatever to beat your opponent, I mean, that's in a competition sort of per, uh, perspective, but, right. um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's just, I think it's just okay. And I've just developed that over time. I mean, I've done a lot of things, but that's because I'm the first person in my family to go to college. So like, I just sort of had to make my own opportunities in a mm. lot of ways. And so I just tried a lot of stuff and I did a lot of stuff that I absolutely hated. <laughs> like you earlier, you mentioned, um, that I did like telemarketing, which is like the worst possible thing <laughs> for my general personality, which is quiet and introverted. It, it, it is hilarious. <laughs> imagining you like, <laughs> I lasted two center. days at the job. Let's, let's be fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the guy that was like tr training me, uh, it's kind of a funny story. The, the guy that was training me for that, um, he, I realized after the fact that after I did it for two days, that he picked up the phone, pretended to dial someone and then like pretended to make a sale to like show how like easy it was, but he was just completely full of shit. <laughs> um, which is, you know, a lesson learned for, hmm. um, uh, you know, people in sales. <laughs> <laughs> we, we might get into this at multiple scales, but how much, uh, how much do you plan? Like, uh how much time and effort do you spend planning your day or week, your month, and just kind of like organizing your life versus like just deciding to do stuff? We were talking a little bit about this yesterday. And I think that, I think that I've internalized a lot of planning, I would say that that's more the answer to that question. Um, but it's only because I've done, I've planned very complicated field experiments. I've planned like working for this startup that I co-founded, I, you know, I did a lot of project management for that and I just sort of internalized that and then just applied it to my own life. So now I'm sort of, I mean, I, I post these images on the forum of generally the direction I want to head for the year. And then it sort of just always works out that I'm looking for opportunities to link those types of things up. Like I gave in the earlier example of us on this road trip, um, you know, we're going on a road trip, we're picking up some equipment. I can hit up these trout streams. We're also going to a wedding. I can come here and visit you. And like, all of that is done. Like, those are all things that I want to do. <laughs> um, and then the opportunity comes about that it all sort of, um, coalesces and, um, congeals, I guess. Yeah. So it, I mean, it feels like you, it's not like making pulling all these things together into one uh trip event didn't take like an enormous amount of logistics like you didn't need to go through some well it's not that it didn't take any logistics but it all if it all kind of came together in a sense that it's like oh this and i can combine this and take these off the shelf of like the web of your life and then just pull them together does that, is that about right? yeah yeah that that makes that's a that's a good way to put it um yeah, I've, I've, I've also posted on the forum, um, some ideas about how to try to think about that, where you take different, different ideas that you want to incorporate in your life. And then you just run some sort of randomization script 
to try to combine all of them. Um, and then you take whatever the combination is from this randomization script and then try to come up with a, a project on the fly where you could actually do that. And not that you're going to do 90% of those projects, but it sort of trains you to think in that way to be able to combine um, different goals um, to, you know, to move in, in this in this nice like vector space. I mean, we're not going to talk about vector spaces here, but, but, but that's basically what it is. <laughs> and, and and for anyone who wants to uh, to run that script, Cody's got it posted on like the, the first or second page of his journal. You can just copy and paste that. For the people who aren't major computer nerds, you probably just write slips of put 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 your ideas on slips of paper and put them in a hat and pull them out yeah yeah and pull them out and and it it sort of i found that it was diminishing returns after five but uh your mileage may vary so enjoy <laughs> so you you have a really high drive you've written about this on the forum before um and you're you're very active but what's unique about you to me is that your drive isn't monomathic i mean like you, you don't have a singular focus. You're not just driven at like just your job or just this or just that. You're very broad. You like really, uh, you really fulfill to my eyes that, you know, the whole Renaissance ideal thing. You have a breadth of skills and interests. Um, uh, and, and I, the, uh, th there's three like prongs to that, that you've kind of written about and that I wanted to pull out. One is, uh, just an, an innate drive. What were you like as a kid <laughs> in terms of like, just drivenness. Well, I, as a kid, so my background, and I've also written about this in the forum, I'm dyslexic. And so um, that offered, and, you know, th there was a bunch of opportunities <laughs> for me to like mess up in that way. And, um, but it also provided, um, I guess, opportunities for me to figure things out that were nonlinear to like make things make sense for me. Mm. And, um, so after teaching myself a lot, I just realized that I can teach myself whatever I want. Um, did you have to teach yourself because the common modalities of learning that you were exposed to just didn't work? So you had to figure out your own way or yeah, yeah. Like more or less like, um, like early math things where you were manipulating symbols, um, because they were letters, that was really hard for me. Hmm. But once I built up like some physical intuition for geometry and then uh, calculus, those types of things, then it became way easier because I have a really good spatial awareness and I can just manipulate those things in my head. So, uh, you know, a, a normal way is to teach it through writing, but in reality, I needed to be more visual. Hmm. I'm just a very visual person, hmm. so, but, but I, I'm, I'm not sure if that, that sort of like sets the <laughs> stage for, uh, for, for your question, which was, um, yeah if I had a, a drive as a kid, I mean, I think that I always did. Um, I grew up in this family. We were right at the poverty line, but my parents were really interested in spending time outside. We did a lot of buckskinning and, uh, bushcraft, which I've also written about a lot on the forum. Um, and in that mentality, you always problem solve and always try to make stuff. And there's a very, large DIY ethic within that. And so if I have drive, I just have confidence that I can figure it out. Mm. It's not like I want to always be on top or something. I mean, I like competing and I like winning, but I like the mature version of that, which is you're competing against someone and you're both pushing one another to be the best or to, to bring out the best. And even if you lose, you still like push yourself, you know? Mm. You're making me think something that I, I thought that I haven't had yet from having conversations with you for a couple of days. And that's that like, maybe drive is the wrong word or not the wrong word, but maybe another word that would be appropriate is a set like you as a sense of empowerment, your early experiences may have given you a sense that you were capable and competent to be able to do things that you wanted. And so it's like, oh, well I just can. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like. Yeah, I, I think I, I think I think that you're right. Like it's not necessarily drive. I mean yeah, I'm driven to have done the things, but I don't I don't want to do them only to do them. I want to enjoy doing them while doing mm -hmm. them. Um but like going back as a as your first question, as a child, I mean I mean if you can like build your own shelters as a child and you're like camping out in the woods, like 
that gives you a certain amount of autonomy, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, I just I just developed that at a at a young age. Something that's come up on the forum before is, you know, we're we're all a bunch of frugality nerds, right? And we're a lot of us are trying to sort of earn our own freedom and early retire, this sort of thing, right? Um, and a number of people who have come from backgrounds um, of poverty or near poverty or scarcity, uh, it, th there, there seems to be a, a trend where it's easy for these people to get into like what we call one year, one more year syndrome, or like, I need to keep saving. They find it difficult to let go of continually pursuing financial security. And you seem not to have that despite coming from, um, you know, uh, uh, a background of poverty and it seems like maybe at that your experience bushcrafting relates to that yeah i i think so because you're sort of just training yourself that you can be resourceful in many ways and i i just i i honestly like never have fear that i can make money <laughs> um i i mean like maybe not like a lot of money but like i've done a lot of shitty things and if i had to just go back and flip burgers like okay i mean yeah still i don't want i don't i don't want to do that but like if i had to do that i would mm. you know but also it like that doesn't matter for me anymore <laughs> but uh but yeah but you know but that's also how you sort of survive in academia i mean like once i started grad school i i've just basically lived on roughly 20k a year since grad school i mean which is uh, i graduated i started grad school in like 2007 or something so mm. i mean yeah, I could be more frugal, but I don't really, I, I, I've, you know, gone up and down from there, but more or less I've lived at that level for a long time. And it's, it's easy once you have, um, a higher paying job to just stay at that level, <laughs> um, and then say the rest. And, and that sort of like brought me into this whole, I guess, fire and eerie. Um, I mean, I, I read a little bit of Mr. Money Mustache, um, but I was kind of like, it wasn't very interesting. And then I started reading Jacob's blog and I was like, oh, this is actually way more interesting because Jacob was also an academic. Mm. Um, and so that appealed to me more that he was, you know, giving up academia and figuring out something more interesting to do. The That's a good segue to kind of what I viewed as the second um, prong of your, of, of your drive and focus and organization, which was like a training element to it. Uh, so, and, and that would be both academia and startup. You've, you've referenced these. So this is again on the theme of you seem to be really good at knowing what you want to do, creating a plan, whether it's at this point more of an intuitive plan, but you seem to be very effective at the things you want to do, knowing what you want to do and, and doing them. Could you talk about, uh, you know, what you learned or the, the sort of training you got from academia and, and startup life? Uh, sure. I mean, um, both of them are, I would say if, if you're serious about them, they're actually life like full, full on full contact lifestyles. Um, <laughs> it's going to eat into all of your time because you're competing against other specialists that are not sleeping as much or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I had a fairly good balance. Like I always exercised. Um, I always try to eat well and sleep well. Um, but especially at the height of like academia, I, you know, that's all I was doing. That's all I was thinking about. Um, and I just, I honestly just got burnt out on it. <laughs> Taking a specialist attitude towards something that you think will work and then finally seeing it work is like, I don't know. That's, that's where, that's where it's at. That's like the best, that's the best possible thing. So you have this idea that you're not sure that will work and then you use your resourcefulness and your training and your ideas and then you move in that direction and then you see if it will work and that's both how research works and that's also how startups work and you're sort of relying on luck in both of those cases because um you're not actually sure you know whether whether to continue um and whether they're going to be successful but but that comes back to what we talked about earlier is that well, if it's not successful, then you just do something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, so we talked about like innate drive, we talked about the training and then there's this third prong of the trident, which is like life experience. 
and you had uh, someone very close to you pass away and that you've written about this as well, that it was a very powerful experience for you in terms of like sealing the deal on an a realization that life is short and that you should only do the things that you want to do. Can you talk about that? Okay, yeah, to um, provide the audience with a bit of context, um, I was married uh, to a researcher. Her name was Sharon Beth Gray. She was um, on a uh, work trip, a research trip funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to Ethiopia to work on um, cassava and sweet potato genetics uh, to help them uh, de develop varieties that were resistant to uh, various root-borne pathogens. Um, and there were these children that were throwing rocks at uh, vehicles uh, as they were passing by. And my wife happened to be, um, the, a rock came through the window of the vehicle and struck my wife. Um, and she ended up passing away from her injuries from that. And so, um, yeah, I, uh, had to, or I'm including these additional details because there are different accounts that are on the internet, um, making statements about, uh, political strife and things like that in Ethiopia, which were actually going on at the time. But, um, uh, my wife's death w was not, uh, associated with that, um, in collaboration with the state department, we did a, a long investigation. Um, and so there was nothing of the sort. It was just sort of a freak accident. Um, but anyway, um, after she passed away, then I sort of rallied in my grief, um, and started a foundation for something that she was really passionate, passionate about, which is mentoring women in science. And there was one particular woman that she interacted with, uh, a researcher, an Ethiopian researcher. And, uh, the initial idea was to bring this researcher, uh, to the U S and, uh, to raise some money in order to be able to do that. Um, but as the story progressed and more people became interested in the story, um, we actually ended up raising close to $200,000. And so I created a foundation, um, and we dispersed all that money, uh, across various organizations. Um, and so to date we have close to 50 researchers, I think that are, uh, that were funded, uh, through this to do various, uh, scientific projects. And that includes, um, some Ethiopian researchers who, uh, after their time, uh, visiting the United States, then they got into various, uh, agricultural graduate programs, uh, in the United States. And so they're actually, they should be close to finishing up, uh, at this point. And so I had to, I had to deal with this, uh, of course, um, this like, uh, tragedy, um, in my life. And, um, yeah, if, if anything pushed me to basically give zero fucks about anything, I mean, that, that really did. <laughs> um, so I only ever do things that I want to do. Um, and I do them to 100%. It's like all or nothing, um, for me and, and not in a, not in a, in an unhealthy way. Cause I do lots of things. So I do lots of things to 100% of my capacity at that time. And I think that, yeah, having someone that you love, um, die unexpectedly, um, I mean, it really puts life into focus and, um, if, if only we could all have that focus, I mean, I think that the world would actually be a better place. Um, it's very trite to say like life is short, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it really is. So, yeah. Something I'm working on really intensely right now is figuring out how to only do the things that I want to do, <laughs> which is, uh, something that I've been quite terrible at for most of my life. Um, even to the point of like, not really knowing what it is that I want to do. Um, and I, it actually occurs to me that you might be the wrong person to ask how to like, to give advice to people <laughs> who have not had, you know, an experience like you've had, like, how do you, how, like, how can I, 
how could someone like me take that advice and internalize it? You could still run the simulation in your head, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we all are going to die. People around you that you love are going to die. So, you know, would you live your life differently? I mean, that's like, it's, it's this, it's getting at the same thing. <laughs> um, but does that really hit you in a visceral way? Probably not. I'm not sure that I'm, I'm the best, I'm the best person for that. But before this happened with Sharon, like I was still living basically like that. I was just living in this structure of academia and startup land, which is sort of like a linear path, but now I'm following a nonlinear path, which is way funner how much of her death impacted how much you spread out and like broadened what you did? So we were both, um, at the level of, we were like advanced postdocs. We both had national science foundation postdoc fellowships. Like we we're at the top of our game. We we're inter starting to interview for faculty positions, doing onsite interviews at R1 institutions. Like we were full on doing, going to do academia. And then we started thinking, well, do we really want to do that? And, and then, and then she like, unfortunately passed away. And so that just really made me take a step back for having this like extreme specialist career, <laughs> um, which a lot of people do. And a lot of people struggle with whether that's on the ERE forum or the other fire forums, I'm assuming I don't frequent the other ones, but, um, <laughs> I think we can all learn from these types of stories. Um, but whether or not you actually like incorporate it into your own life in a visceral way, I think that's, that's hard to do, but you can, you can run the simulation. I mean, you can pretend as if someone close to you died for a week or something, and that would probably make you appreciate things in, in a similar way. There's a lot of, um, Buddhist meditation practices where you have one more year to live or something like that, or equivalent things. So it's like, what would you do differently? if you kind of down 365 days and it's like, Oh, I'm dead. Like you're still alive, but how would you live your life differently? If you mm -hmm. only have one more year to live or something like that, there, there's a lot of those types of types of things that you could gain insight from, I think. Sure. In a similar way. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the epiphanies I've had just sort of trying to piece together your story is that one can be intentional and structured and organized and driven to do a bunch of things that one wants to do, which sounds very obvious now that I've said it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, for very long, like I've, I've been into GDD for a long time. I'm into Scott Young. Like I'm into all these, like, you know, how to get better at doing stuff, how to, how to be effective and how to like, uh, and not just in a complete like workaholic nose to the grindstone sort of way, but like pick something you want to do and like, how do you get really good at that? But I always had this, I, for me, it always translated as, um, apply this methodology, whatever it is to the things that you have to do, to the things that you ought to do, um, to the things that you should do. Um, and I'm sitting in a place where I don't have to do a damn thing at the moment, like I have no obligation and it's like, oh, I could apply these methodologies to whatever I want to do. So what is that? Uh, a little bit more context. You left, uh, your startup in 2020 and you had like a, you had like a six months of downtime in which you test ran early retirement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's more or less, uh, that was more or less my idea. So, uh, the idea was to, um, just focus on art. Um, and I started doing art. This sort of relates back to the last question. Um, I started doing art, um, in 2019 as a way to like, well, you know, life is short. I always wanted to do art and some like asshole guidance counselor in high school was like, if you want to go to college, you shouldn't do art. And you know, what do I know? Cause <laughs> my parents couldn't tell me that <laughs> otherwise. So I took Spanish instead, which was fine. I mean, that like offered other things, but anyway, yeah. So I decided to, um, I had been doing art consistently every morning, you know, for like 15 or 20 minutes or something, but I'm like, oh, I, I really want to take some time off. Um, I got burned out from the startup, which happens a lot. And, um, so I just wanted to take six months and just do art. 
exercise and cook. And that's all I did. Um, and you know, cooked for my partner while she worked full time and it was great. And I leveled up in my art like so much. <laughs> it was, it was, it was a really good time. I, I treated it as if I was in art school. So I'm like, oh, wow. um, you know, I have a structure every day I'm drilling and I'm just going to get really good. Um, was that always fun or is, Oh no, no. I mean, there was a lot of like, do I really want to be doing this? And it's like, yes, you, you, you ha like you have this time. Um, this is something you want, you said you wanted to do in the past and only because it's hard now, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you, but you still have to continue. And I'm so glad that I put in those pencil miles as, as I call it. I mean, this is a common, um, artistic term yeah. to, in the same way that you train for a marathon, you can train for art by putting the pencil miles or running the miles. So I think we kind of touched on this, but how do you find the right balance so that you're not either overthinking or underthinking, uh, over planning or under planning? Like, is that, is that just kind of an iterative iterative process for you? Was it, was there a period in time when you over planned overthought through how to do things and struggled to like get in there and do things? Or is that, how do you, how do you manage that in your life? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would say like, I really honed that in during grad school. So by the end of grad school, I was spending less time overthinking things and just, I mean, th still thinking about it, but actually trying it and trying to do whatever the whole process was, whether that was learning a new protocol or something like that. Um, because you learn a lot of weird techniques that actually make it go faster. So you should just practice the whole thing, whatever that is. Um, like, I think that there's some competition where they talk about like stuffing letters or something. Have you heard about this? Where, yeah. where like the idea is that you have to like fold all these letters and you have to fold 500 of them. And the people that go, th you like fold and then stuff the letters and then lick the envelope and then you're done and maybe like label it or something. So you have this whole process assembly line and the people that learn to do that start by doing the whole process um each time they're they're like 30 percent faster or something hmm. um in the end rather than doing each step sequentially because you learn all of these like minor things for like yeah. well how does the paper fold and to stuff more efficiently into the envelope so there's a lot of like pieces within the process um to like flow between the steps. And so I'm like obsessed with process. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, like to, to think about it in, in that way. Um, because you get a lot of gains in efficiency by doing that. And you also learn, um, at the same time, rather than just intellectualizing it and overthinking it. Hmm. Um, and m my really smart engineering friend told me this term festino lente, which is, um, I think it's a Latin term, um, make haste slowly. Hmm. So it's like this, um, sort of oxymoron, but it's like the idea is that you move at a pace that you're always moving forward. You're not overthinking, you're not underthinking, you're making quality and then you're moving on. If you can like harness that energy, it's, it's actually quite liberating. I don't know. I mean the same for all creative things, right? Yeah. Like you're making this podcast now, so. Festina Lente. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that reminds me of um, uh, slow, is smooth, smooth is fast. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, slow down to hurry up. Yeah, that that, that reminds me. Uh, one of my favorite books on that topic is I want to say it's called The Practicing Mind, and it's it's very much about this. This guy, he gives a an example. He's a piano tuner, and he's got this crazy day where he's got to do he's got to tune this piano for a famous concert pianist and then he's got to get across town to this other one and it's like an impossible amount of time to do it and he's like well i'm totally screwed either way so why don't i just try this idea and like instead of like getting his toolbox and just grabbing the tools and laying them out and getting after it he just he like he takes his tools out like one at a time and lays them down next to each other neatly and then picks one up makes an adjustment, puts it down and just like complete present focus on everything, forgetting about the time. Um, whereas normally he'd be like madly rushing through it. And he like had enough time to go for lunch 
you know like he got done like way sooner and everyone was really happy with his work and he just like just slowed way down um and like he didn't make any mistakes and just... yeah he, he was he was he was he was like relaxed into the flow of whatever he was doing and yeah i mean if there's any thing that i try to achieve on a daily basis in multiple domains is flow like that's what i want to do i want to flow when i trail run i want to flow when i do art i want to flow when i write um, when I'm cooking, whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, do you have goals? I mean, they're, they are goals because you need like objective things, but they're not like, yeah, I, I, I do have goals, but they're more like nebulous. It's sort of like, yeah, I want to do kind of that thing, um, over there. And if, but I do track what I do, um, on a daily and monthly basis. And a lot of that I put illustrate on the forum. And part of that is to look back at the month. And if you really want to do something and you've put up zero, literally zero amount of time <laughs> uh, towards that thing, then I found that I either don't understand what it is I'm trying to do, mm. or it's not broken down enough into a small enough piece that I can actually move forward on it. And so then if I still want to do it at the, having not done it at the end of the month, then I, um, yeah, try to try to break it down and, and spend the time. So it's like, that's where the, the planning part comes in. Mm. So it's like the feedback, uh, the, uh, the review, the reflection provides the feedback for if you need to increase the amount of planning for something. Absolutely. Yeah. I like that. So, yeah, you, so that, that, that prevents you from over planning because you only plan when you need to. And when, if, if you're doing what you want to do, you don't need to plan it, right? Exactly. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. So the next topic I want to talk about is incorporating work into your web of goals. I actually asked my uh, my mastermind group uh, if they had any questions for you. And this is this is one. <laughs> okay. Um, that they had. So thank you, mastermind group. It's a good mastermind group. If I, if I so this is this is good. Yeah. Oh, they're they're great. They're awesome. <laughs> You're actually like uh, somewhat technically FI, right? Like you could kind of not work if you didn't. Oh yeah, want I mean, to. I I I would like last year. Like, okay. I don't need to work anymore. It's C fine. Congrats, but, but you are. Yeah, but I am because I'm still learning. I still have really good colleagues, um, a graduate student that I'm mentoring. It's like all that stuff means more to me than like yeah, sure. There's stuff I have to do that I don't want to do, but yeah. it's not that bad. <laughs> In the grand scheme of things, <laughs> uh, well, and and even before you were FI, I think you you obviously did a really good job of 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 incorporating other interests into your life. At least um, for many years, you have, um, and you've already talked about that. I think I'll I'll talk for myself, but also a lot of people, you know, when they have a full time job, it's easy for that to take over. Like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't resonate at all when you were describing like, oh, you know, when you're at a startup or doing something that like academia, something that takes up a lot of your time, you, you have to do extra curriculars. I'm like, my extracurriculars were in a six pack. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, um, okay. Wait, to be clear, I, I have been down that road as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> did, did you, when you took that mini sabbatical in 2020, did, did that, did that experience change? anything with regards to your perspective on, on work? Well, well, yeah, I mean, because in, in the same way that you, um, so if we back up to when I was talking about academia, like the goal in academia, more or less, uh, is to get tenure, right? So what is tenure? The university pays you, uh, a salary or whatever, and you try to bring in grant money. Um, but once you have tenure, you're basically, you know, they can't fire you for <laughs> like, you can explore whatever you want. And I'm like, well, how does that actually work? And so I started looking into it and it's like, oh, the university has endowments. Um, they pay these professors, they have these funding lines, the professors, as they move up the ranks, they're bringing in money to the university. Um, and I'm like, well, how does the money work then? Um, and I was like, oh, you can just get tenure by saving up a bunch of money. <laughs> Uh, so there are two ways to tenure, it turns <laughs> out there's like the regular academic route, or you can just save a bunch of money and then, um, you know, 
do things that interest you. And so I'm, I don't need to work, but all of these things interest me mm. and I get to interact with a lot of really smart people and learn all the time. Um, and that's what I really value. So in a lot of ways, it's not really work. Um, I mean, especially since I started this new like communications gig, I have work in quotes cause it's, it's all, <laughs> it, it's fun. It's, it's really fun. And, and the people are really passionate about what they do. So, yeah. The, uh, so, so you've, you've DIY tenured and the income is somewhat of an incidental yield. Yeah. But I, I, I mean, I have, I have other goals for that money as well. Like, yeah. um, that's like a backup in case I need that for my mom or whatever, but I don't, yeah, I don't, I no longer need to work. So, yeah, that's but cool. it, but it, but it, but that's like liberating. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so liberating, um, to, to be there. Um, and then you can just do what you want. I mean, yeah, I'm not going to work buy an ice cream truck and like drive around and sell <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> uh, but unless that was your dream. In yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Can, can, dream dream cream cone or something <laughs> you, you can... that doesn't sound right <laughs> at all <laughs> that sounds terrible <laughs> it does sound terrible hopefully I answered uh, the question for your mastermind group From in one sense I think that like your answer was like oh well I just like doing what I'm doing mm -hmm. and it's almost like oh well yeah I guess that makes sense <laughs> no, alright fair enough right I just like to interrupt this program briefly to give a shout out to our sponsor, the joy of not being sold anything. All right, carry on. I just wanted to point out we are lighting a beeswax candle courtesy of Megan, aka More Trees. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Megan. It is at night here. We're both in bed, my bed. We've got candlelight, <laughs> got the mood set quite nicely. It's a big ERE sleepover, really. <laughs> so I wanted to dig in a little bit more about this whole work thing. Part of the context of the question is is that there's there's this whole like to work or not to work. Like on the form sometimes we write work like W asterisk R K like it's a swear word. Yeah, I never really understood. That. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone, uh, lots of people are listening to that right now and going, "You bastard." <laughs> um, uh, maybe we can start with like just describe what 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 your work is right now. Like, wh what do you do? What do you, what is the project? And what is what are your duties? And uh, yeah, what is that? Uh, yeah, so I'm um, I'm a researcher at UC Berkeley. I work on um, fire recovery in California ecosystems, um, not just California ecosystems, but all fire recovery, but, um, we specialize in California ecosystems. And, um, so I took this fellowship, um, a couple years ago, um, to apply my spatial statistical modeling skill set towards a different problem. I was working on it in, uh, plants, looking at like single cells, um, in plants. And it turns out that the math scales very nicely um, across these different scales. So you can model comings and goings of molecules in different cells or comings and goings of insects or plants um, in this different patchwork across fire um, ecosystems. And um, more recently, I've taken that knowledge of fire ecology and started doing interviews across um, the different people that deal with fire data or deal with fire recovery, whether that's firefighters, um, forest managers, academics, whatever. And I thought that that after talking with all these people, uh, for research purposes, um, for my own research, that there was a large gap in how they actually communicated with one another. And so I basically got this halftime gig to do science communication for the Institute that I was working for. And I don't just work on fire there, but a lot of the content that I make is related to, to fire. So taking all of this knowledge, illustrating, um, concepts that can be understood across these different domains for people that are dealing with fire and then trying to communicate that to them, um, across these different modalities. And this is like extremely fun because it's both technical and I get to do art and writing and 
I have two like really great uh, science communications mentors and a, a science journalism mentor. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm learning a lot. So I always look at jobs for how much I'm going to learn rather than what they offer me in pay. I mean, I could be making way more, way, way, way more money in industry. Um, but I'm not doing it for that. I, I want to learn uh, these other skills. So, yeah. and, and integrate the other things that I've, that I've learned. And so when this job came up, I applied for it. I got it, even though I didn't have as much experience with the communication aspect of things, but most communications people don't have a science background. And mm. so I have a huge advantage, um, in that respect, but I have a huge disadvantage because I'm used to just communicating to other scientists oh, and, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, on the technical side of things. So, um, that's where these, uh, mentorships come in. Mm. And so. Yeah, it's really fun being mentored by someone that's like 10 years younger than you. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, and, and yeah, she's great. So nice. Yeah. So it's, you're learning, it's interesting. It's fun. You get to use multiple skills and interests and deploy them in a way. And we were also talking about this earlier today where it is in, in most established fields or skills or activities. It's very difficult to be the best. It's very difficult to get like, you know, top whatever in this field. But if you combine a couple of things that are very rarely combined, it can be a lot easier to be like the best person that combines these three things or these four things or the best, or just, you know, be, be a very, be a person with the rare skills that is, that can be sought out for. Yeah. And that that's sort of how I'm thinking about it. And, um, I mean, I really like to learn, um, and so basically the possibilities I feel are endless with this <laughs> because if I get bored in some way with fire, which I think there's still a lot there, um, there's a lot of other things that I could, that I could work on. And so now as part of this trip that I did to the Southwest, there have been a number of recent fires in the native trout drainages in recent years that have like completely decimated trout populations. And so then, okay, well now then that becomes part of the story too. Mm. And the thing that I'm interested in researching. So not only am I looking at these trout drainages, but then I'm bringing in the other things that I've learned through modeling these large ecosystem processes, but applied to trout. And then, then I can talk to people who actually study trout. <laughs> um, I just, you know, study them by trying to catch them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> The quote that's coming to mind is that, that famous, famous to the forum, at least quote, uh, I forget the name of it. A, a true master of life makes no sharp distinction between his leisure and his work, something like that. It's a whole paragraph. That's this great quote. Are you, are you familiar with what I'm talking about? I, I think, I think so. I think of, I mean, I can't quote it from memory because yeah. I'm, I'm sort of bad at that stuff. I'll, pro I'll, I'll probably but, dub it in cause it's so good. And... Yeah. You, you should dub it in here. <laughs> 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 Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> a master in the art of living draws no sharp distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his mind and his body, his education and his recreation. He hardly knows which is which. He simply pursues his vision of excellence through whatever he is doing and leaves others to determine whether he is working or playing. To himself, he always appears to be doing both. It's a quote by L.P. Jax. I think there needs to be some exploration for what you do. I mean, if you're not learning, if you're not learning anything new, I mean, my opinion and, and how I always approach things is if I'm not learning anything new or 50% of my time is not, and I think I've written this in the forum too. Um, if I'm not learning at least 50% of the time, I'm, I'm like figuring out how to do something else. <laughs> yeah. I want to learn. I want to combine things. I want to integrate things. I mean, that's like the funnest part, like writing science articles. Like, yeah, I can do that. I've done a bunch of that. <laughs> um, but I don't like really care about that anymore. I want to do science articles. I want to do illustrations. I want to do adventure writing. I want to figure out this like nebulous space that combines those things. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there are a lot of people doing that and that's where I want to be. Hmm. And that's the direction I'm headed. It sounds like you, you are 
not anywhere near the end of uh, cohering your vocation, working on your vocation, and that's like a process with a nebulous goal, <laughs> like you already talked about. Yeah, and and I think I think I mentioned to you yesterday or the day before or whatever, just like that. I'm I just feel really comfortable being uncomfortable, whether that's <laughs> like physical or mm. mental or in like weird social situations. I mean, that comes back to like being a kid and like being introverted, like little punk ass like sitting by myself at the lunch table like you realize oh actually most of these people i don't give a fuck about <laughs> <laughs> so like and probably you know it's not that i don't care about people um i do care about people i care about them a lot but um most people's opinions um don't actually matter because they, they can't hurt you hmm. this is another thing that is relate this is another thing that is related to everything we've been talking about um you are, I mean, like it, it is, your art is very obvious and it's very like incorporated into everything. Like your updates on the journal, you draw them. <laughs> you don't just write them out, you draw them. Right. And I mean, like, I think within 10 minutes of when we met a week and a half ago for the first time, like we were still talking, but you just had your sketchbook out and you were just like drawing. Uh, you, I think you're a great example of how ERE post-consumer praxis, right, can be highly supportive of people who want to have artistic endeavors. And um, Gin and Juice Brian, who I'm talking with tomorrow, is actually a, a, another example of this. Like, there's there's an idea that if you want to be an artist, you either have to be broke and starving or sell out. And, but you've, you've, you've got DIY tenure, so you, it just works. That wasn't really a question, but <laughs> <laughs> this was something that the mastermind group just, they, uh, they brought it up. They're like, Cody is a great example of how you can like do your art and incorporate your art into your life, into your web of goals. And Erie can like support that and you can do it. Um, Deb, any thoughts on that? Yeah. I, I mean, um, I would step back from Erie and just say that that is more part of like a systems goal approach. Mm -hmm. Like, ERE teaches systems thinking. Yeah, so I would say it's more a systems goal um, approach than ERE specifically. But sure. um, for the like finance side of things, for the taking care of your other life things, I mean, I think that that, that it really, that can really help. I mean, it's a lot harder to be an artist and like, live in upper middle class lifestyle or whatever <laughs> that everyone else is trying to to do but yeah it, it, it allows enough um enough freedom to to be able to do that um i think i mean i'm, I'm trying to think about this if i was like approaching this and i was only doing art right because i think that, that, that that's like more the question and there may be other forum members whether current or in the future that may listen to this to to think about this and yeah i think that like especially if you're avoiding finances or avoiding other things that are actually really important to your freedom, you should not be because you can make way more art if you're free to do that uh, than you can otherwise. And so, yeah, I, I think that, that the like grinding a little bit, um, even if it's not doing art, you know, you're just always keeping up your art muscle um, mm -hmm. while you're grinding at some other job. Um, but for, you know, a relatively short amount of time uh, to to save up enough to, to then pursue art full time. Because like, in reality, art is like, if you're making good money in art, you've had a lot of time to develop an audience or whatever. And it's about human relationships, at least as far as I understand it. Um, and I'm not making, I've made a little bit of money from art, but I'm not making a ton, but right. that's sort of how I understand it. And like the direction I'm going for like doing freelance stuff. And so, um, yeah, if you're listening to this and you want to try to try to approach that, just like grind and do art for five years. You, you mean like the, the grinding and the art are two different things is what you mean? Yeah. I mean, you could grind and do art. I mean, you might risk burning out on art. So that's what I mean by earlier when I was saying that you should always have extracurriculars. If mm -hmm. like, 
if you don't have enough energy for extracurriculars, you need to like really think about your sleep, mm. uh, your diet and your exercise. If you don't have those things in place, which are all like fundamentals of ERE, um, <laughs> then like, it's kind of hopeless to like work at a high level. I mean, you look at any professional athlete or something like those three things are taken care of. They're like, dialed. Yeah. They're dialed. I mean, LeBron James, I think that he spends like a million dollars a year on just like icing his knees and stuff between practice and like doing all this stuff. And like, yeah, okay. He can afford that, but, but he's also doing that so he can perform at that, at that level. Kind of a left turn. Uh, tell me about your epic Epicurean dinners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, my Epicurean dinners, uh, those started in grad school when I live with my late wife, Sharon and, um, a roommate Gretchen and Gretchen was an extremely good cook and she still is to this day and she's actually way better, which is like surprising. <laughs> so I learned a lot of my cooking skills from, uh, from her. Um, and we just started hosting these dinners like once a month and it would be either at our apartment uh, that we shared together or at other people's places. And we just continued that, um, when we went to postdocs and, um, now we, uh, Karin and I continue that where we, where we live in Cascadia. So, and the idea with, um, Epicurean dinners is that you once a month, you, uh, come up with a place to meet, you prepare this like nice meal. Maybe you indulge in whatever, uh, substances you like, <laughs> uh, um, and, and it's sort of, uh, a celebration and a, I mean, it's, it's sort of, I guess, hedonistic in some way, but then the rest of the time for the rest of the month, you're much more relaxed and much more reserved. Mm. And the idea is that you have this one time a month that you can let loose and hang out with friends and wherever the evening goes and you can listen to music, you can dance all night, or you can just end at nine and go to bed. Like that's fine too. Yeah. So, so we, we started doing that and, um, we've done that Oh, well, I've personally done that multiple iterations in the different places that I've lived. And it always turns out like really fun. Like sometimes it will turn into an art thing, or there was a time during my postdoc that it was all book club related. So we'd have like a book club related potluck Epicurean dinner hmm. and we would read a book, have dinner together, drink some wine, you know, and enjoy life, um, talk about things. So I like that. I like that a lot. I'm pretty sure you're responsible for introducing me to, uh, Bill Pluck and stuff. Um, and, uh, his work has played a pretty important role in your life. I think, can you tell me about like when you found him, when you got into him, what your, what your relationship with his stuff is? Yeah. So, um, I would say that as a caveat, I'm very much of, uh, an introductory student, I would say to Bill Pawkins work. Cause like his whole idea is that you have a whole lifetime to develop, um, different skills and different aspects of yourself, um, to try to work towards this, being this, uh, mature human that f is, you know, fully engaged in, with the world and you bring your gifts to the world, whatever those may be, whether those are scientific, artistic programming, um, diesel mechanic, like whatever, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. Like, yeah. Whatever. Um, and I read a decent amount of his soul craft book when I think I was in grad school and it didn't quite resonate with me. It was like kind of resonating, but not really. And, um, more recently I, um, I picked up some of his newer works, which he had much more refined. The idea with his work is that you, you work on both the positive aspects of yourself and you sort of come up with these Jungian character types of the positive aspects of your personality and also the potentially negative aspects of your personality. And you sort of name them and you build characters around them. And the idea with that is that you're using, um, you're using your imagination to try to like work out how these characters are thinking, what are their different motivations. Um, and all of those characters essentially combine into what you conceive as yourself, um, mm -hmm. uh, consciously or unconsciously, <laughs> which is like, you know, the, the, 
the deeper parts um, am i just rambling yeah no it's good i um uh my introduction to him to his stuff was at like the perfect time in my life and i have this i have this weird relationship with his books where i'll, I'll read something it'll be like and it'll just hit like at a soul level and i'll be like this is exactly what i need <laughs> right now and it's super helpful and i have lots of epiphanies and i really grow or unlearn or whatever i need at the time and then like a month later i'll go and read the exact same thing and it's like my mind rejects it not 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 like it's just like nope don't read that it's like i can't get through a paragraph of it yeah it's really yeah. strange um but i've gotten a lot out of it and um i've really appreciated his 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 models yeah and well i, I mean i think like as far as um development and personal development growth goes uh i think that, that helped me really um me personally work through some things about my ideas about um like coming back to academia and doing these more um communication and more applied aspect roles because academia is all about um there's some applied aspects but it's mostly about basic research and if you're not a professor you're not anything like there's a lot of these like sort of unsaid um unsaid rules and um i think that Bill Plotkin's work helped me really grapple with those things that actually, you know, the, the things that I was, that caused a lot of friction when I was in academia, now I actually feel are just fine. And like by doing this work and it's like, well, no, it's actually okay that I'm interested in lots of things. Like I don't want to be a world renowned professor. Like I already have tenure in this other way. I can literally work on whatever I want, <laughs> uh, which is amazing. And that helped me, um, as like a final step to to bring all of those pieces together and so my work on that in in the past couple of years has really like helped me solidify things so you know whether or not that's useful for everyone you know it's, it's probably not um and i don't advocate for that you know if you if you have deep depression you shouldn't be uh, attempting attempting these things and he he says that multiple times in his work so hmm. um i'm not advocating for everyone to use these tools but i they were helpful for me so yeah. they're probably helpful for some proportion of whoever the hell is listening to this <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 that makes that makes sense i feel like a lot of what i'm going through right now i can trace back to th some realizations uh, that i had working with his models um but yeah obviously there's going to be some people it resonates with and some people it doesn't and that's fine but uh um you're gonna get married in a month <laughs> <laughs> i am yeah congratulations thank you <laughs> we've been talking about how driven you are how organized you are how, how planning you are how, how much you plan and stuff i was wondering if you had any insights or experiences to share about how you approach uh your relationship uh with karen and like like do you plan your relationship is your relationship intuitively planned like <laughs> how do you how do you balance that sort of thing do you have any uh like advice on that front uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we do have like regularly scheduled meetings for, um, sort of check-in meetings. So we have regular check-ins about finances. We have, uh, a monthly check-in for, I mean, just how things are going, like personally in a relationship, um, what we can improve. And then also try to plan out times where like all the phones, all the internet's off. I mean, with the exception of maybe we're listening to music or something and we just really spend time together. More recently, we've been working on doing dates where we co-create something together. Mm. So like she'll work on a story and then I'll try to draw it or something like that. And it, it turns out that like we've reached the limit of what we feel comfortable giving each other criticism about <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in, in this process, which is also like super helpful. Uh, uh, for, for our, our relationship. So like, <laughs> although technically we could collaborate on a comic, I don't think we're going to be doing it anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that like advice. So I started dating Karin relatively soon after Sharon had passed away and we met through, um, some mutual friends and we had a lot of the same interest. Yeah. I'd be, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell this story about our first date, quote unquote date, <laughs> which is, um, we were introduced by mutual friends. Um, they were both like, Oh, you both like skiing. You both like the mountains. You both like trail running. 
you should hang out. And so um, Karin is very athletic. She came on this trail run with me and it was a very hard technical um, route that we were doing. <laughs> and I look back and I'm like going really hard and she's just like, you know, she's like right behind me <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is a date. <laughs> but but you know she she didn't think about it uh in, in exactly those terms until we actually i actually asked her out on a date <laughs> um but anyway yeah um yeah I, I feel very lucky to um have these two um amazing relationships with these two like beautiful smart intelligent athletic women <laughs> it's just like i'm so fucking lucky <laughs> And so as far as advice, I mean, what I learned with Karin, um, because it was relatively soon after Sharon died, um, that we started hanging out is that we developed, we be became really close very quickly because we developed just like extreme radical honesty about what we were thinking, how we were feeling, um, about things, um, just because of the intensity and gravity of the situation of what I had gone through recently and, um, you know, what I was still dealing with, etc. And so, um, yeah, if, if, if there are any takeaways from that, um, try to develop a way to, um, be radically honest with one another and have a way to, um, give each other critical feedback, um, and start really small with that. Like, Hey, like, I don't like how you, you know, put the sponge in the sink or something <laughs> like really, really small. And then like build from there and, and, and actually make time to, to do that rather than having those sorts of things, um, build up over time because mm. that's really easy to do. Cause it's like, it's hard, but in the end it's actually just like, it's a good way to have a deep intimate connection with people. Um, so do you build like spaces in your relationship where it's like, okay, this is the time when we talk about this stuff if there's anything to talk about yeah exactly so we have i i don't know who exactly came up with this but the concept is like start stop more so can you start doing more of something or start, can you start doing something can you do more of something can you stop doing something mm. um it doesn't matter what order you talk about but that sort of opens it up as these are good things there's also like one thing that's annoying me right and um if you set aside time for that, you're actually open because you thought about like, well, I'm going to give criticism to this other person. They're going to give criticism to me. So I have to take that and, but they're also going to give me positive things. But yeah. Um, so, so like ap after having done that for a while, we now like start, stop, more, go. And then like, <laughs> stop doing this. <laughs> and, and then it's just, it's just okay now. Like we, we, I, I we, we spend less time um, formal time doing that. Mm. Um, but I think that that, but we spent a lot of time developing, uh, that, that trust in, in our relationship to try to do that. So I did something similar, uh, in my last relationship. I had like a weekly check-in meeting. We didn't, I hadn't heard of start, stop, go, but it was, it was kind of similar things. It was like, we definitely found that having, it's like, if you don't have a space for it where it's like, this is what we're doing. This is the time for criticism and also encouragement and everything else. Then it's like, it either doesn't happen or it happens at really inopportune times. You know, it's like, Oh, I'll think about it. So I'll bring it up now. But it's like, look, I'm in the middle of something right now. You know, <laughs> and it's like not a good time to talk about it. Yeah. And, and I think especially on the criticism side of things, like Karin was in academia too, um, before that. So like research, like criticism of ideas. Um, but it's a little like more like knife in the side when, <laughs> when it's like a specific behavior that you do or something. Right. Um, but, but it's fine. It's like it, it probably most of the things you don't even realize that you're doing yeah. that are, you know, actually uh, obnoxious in some way. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that people should just break all their goals down into 20 minute segments and just fucking get after it. Life is short. Just do it. That's all I have to say. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, w where can people find out more about you? Where do you live on the internet? Where would you like them to go? Um, so I have your stuff. I have, uh, two websites, Cody .com and Cody .art. Cody is my, um, blog and 
sort of science and other project. It's a project related website. And then my summarized art portfolio is CodyMarkels.art. And then um, I guess if you want to interact with me on Twitter, which I'm not super on Twitter, or I guess Instagram too, um, it's just Cody Mark at Cody Markels. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for having me here. Man, this is fun. Thanks so much. This is great.